So, do I look more like a scholar now? Okay, so, um, okay, this video is going to make most sense if you see the previous one, number 14, in this hidden knowledge in Old Norse myth series, because I'm just going to continue right where I left off. We're still talking about techniques of ecstasy or vision quest described in the poetic Edda, showing that the poems of the Edda were indeed created within a completely pagan context. I ended the last video with a description of how King Jörvald and his earl, that is, his royal shaman, used dreams, meditations and sacrifice in order to move into the realm of dreams and bring the bright maiden of dreams out from the darkness of death to the world of the living and the waking. Now Jörvald had a son by his maiden, and he was a special one. No name would stick to him. He kept to himself and he spoke little. But one day the prince sat down on a mound, and um, that, my friends, is a burial mound. And this old Norse pagan practice was called utiseta, which means to sit outside, when someone would seek communion with spirits and such like by sitting below, uh, below a hanged man on a burial mound or at the crossroads. We may safely call this practice a vision quest, a pagan technique of ecstasy that required meditation in powerful places. Now this meditation performed by the prince is followed by a vision. Nine Valkyrias suddenly appear before the young man. As most of you know, the Valkyria is a goddess of the dead who resides in Valhalla. From her functions and her names we learn that she is a sort of fate goddess and it has already been established that the Valkyrie are aspects of Freya. So the structure is clear. The vision quest is, as usual, followed by a vision of the supernatural maiden. In this vision, the young man sees nine maidens riding together in a group. They are golden and bright, and rays of light flashes from them as they move. The leader of the group of nine Valkyrias is called Svava, which means the sleeper. She addresses the young prince by giving him his true name, Helgi, which means the sacred one. Now Helgi Jörvardsson asks her counsel and her hand in marriage, and she advises him and gives him trials that he has to overcome. And as soon as he has overcome these trials, they are married, but she is no ordinary housewife. She continues to live within her own band of nine women, riding air and sea and illuminating the world with her rays of light. But she also comes to him as a wife, protects him and guides him like a Valkyria, and, and helps him through life as a whole. And when he finally dies, she follows him into the grave and swears that she will find him again in his next life and be his Valkyria once once more. So, Helgi is indeed reborn, this time as Helgi Hunningsbani, son of Sigmundr, who is a sorcerer king. To make a long story really short, the story of Helgi Hunningsbani is described in the two poems of Helgi Hunningsbani, and they have slightly different versions, so I'm just going to give a brief summary uh, putting the two together, Helgi, because they sort of complement each other. Helgi is born and grows up as a prince and a warrior, and acts unwisely until one day he dozes off, the dreaming theme again. Um, and this happens after he has performed a very odd ritual of drinking the blood of a bear, uh, alternately after having fought a battle and faced death. He falls asleep by the so-called Arastein, which means the rock of the eagle, and the eagle, we know, is a symbol of death. As he falls asleep, the Valkyria appears to him and announces herself, revealing that they were married in his previous life and that he ought to get his act together unless he wants to lose her love. She rebukes him for having destroyed the Froda Frider, which means the peace of wisdom, and for shedding blood needlessly. Hardly what we would normally expect from a Viking Age poem or from a Valkyria's words, but then we do have a lot of stereotypical ideas about what Viking Age people thought about things. We tend to discredit them a bit as mindless, bloodthirsty barbarians who pillage and fail to recognize that there, there may have been more diversity in opinion among these ancestors and deeper spiritual aspects to some of their lore. So now Helgi does get his act together as he learns that his previous death happened as he lost the battle of the Rock of Greed, indeed, and in this life he manages to win that battle, he overcomes greed. As before, the Valkyria comes to his aid in life and in death, 
and death happens as the god Odin decides that he wants to have Helgi as a warrior in Valhalla, lends his spear to an enemy who kills Helgi. And, well, this is to say that he had an honorable death within Viking Age uh, you know, values. The Valkyria bride goes to him in the burial mound and describes herself now, interestingly, as the hungry raven of Odin who wants to drink her lover's blood, which is a suitable and expected line of thought for Valkyria, a goddess of death, and shows what she's capable of. But she will not devour this one. She remembers her love for him and declares that they shall drink the precious mead within the grave before he moves on to Valhalla. Helgi's younger brother, Sigurd, is the next one to go through a ritual of initiation. Now, Sigurd is born after the death of Helgi, and one may wonder if there is another reincarnation of Helgi, but it's not said directly. The story is so long that I cannot go into it in much detail. The important thing is that Sigurd decides that he wants to learn about magic and wisdom, and is taught by a dwarf smith. And this is not coincidental, just that the Earl of King Jörvard was not coincidental. The scholar Lotte Mutz has shown that dwarves in Germanic folklore always represent a sort of priest character. The same is true of blacksmiths, who were regarded as the keepers of sacred knowledge. So the young Prince Sigurd is in fact seeking the teachings of a sort of priest. During his learning period, Sigurd learns about sacred legends and other things. He seeks his own maternal uncle and is told about his fate, and more importantly, about a beautiful golden maiden who sleeps on a sacred mountain, awaiting his arrival. It is stated that the golden maiden, the Valkyria, is a Valkyria, and that she is the sister of Odin, and she has slept ever since Helgi died, whatever that means. This spurs Sigurd further, and he wants to seek the maiden, but he has a duty, namely to avenge his father. So before his initiation he goes to war. On the way he meets Odin, the spirit, standing quietly and balanced on a rock in the middle of a stormy ocean. And the young boy asks the god's advice. And after Sigurd has won the battle and killed all his enemies, he is being praised by his teacher. But he takes no pride in the killings and declares that many a courageous man has never killed another. So he's learned some wisdom on this way. Now Sigurd finally goes on about his initiation. His teacher is an evil man and does not teach to Sigurd about the maiden at all. But Sigurd has already heard about the maiden from his maternal uncle, so he has his own plans. After having killed a serpent and drunk its blood, Sigurd has learned all the secrets of the serpent of death and now he can understand the speech of birds and they tell him about the Valkyria that sleeps on the sacred mountain. Now Sigurd, shining with divine gold, rides up to the mountain, breaks into the walls of fire that surrounds the maiden, cuts her loose from her armor and wakes her up. She offers him the mead of memory and teaches him about runes and how to use them. When Sigurd later dies, the Valkyria rides after him into Hel and saves him from the all-devouring Aogres of death, bringing him back to her home country, Valan or Valhalla, and, and it declares that they will forever be together. Two other Edda poems, the Groa Galder and the Fjörlsvins Mål, tell about a young hero called Svipdager who wants to find Menglöd, which could be translated as invitation to a blend. In order to find his way, he goes to the grave of his mother who had been a witch. This witch was called Groa, which is the name also of a giantess witch who once healed Thor after a battle by singing spell songs. Now the lady is dead, but the young boy sits on her burial mound and invokes her spirit with prayers. The dead woman's, woman's spirit rises from the grave and asks what he wants, and he says that he needs her help and guidance because he wants to find the maiden. Now the woman sings nine powerful spell songs to her child, which sounds familiar, doesn't it? The sitting on a burial mound is the ancient technique of ecstasy known to the Vikings as Utiseta, as I said before. Now the nine spell songs echo the nine spell songs given to Odin before his descent. 
and after having sung the spell songs the dead witch gives her son advice as to how to proceed if he wants to have luck with the maiden. To make a long story short, young Svipdager gets to the impenetrable halls of the maiden in the underworld where he, just like Odin and the Earl Atli, has to show his eloquence to a giant guardian. It is revealed that the bride waiting for him behind the dangerous and deadly gates is seated at the mountain of medicine below the world tree together with her nine handmaidens. Another repeated theme. And she's sleeping as she awaits her true husband. Now in this poem, the Fjörs wins small. The maiden is said to be the lord of all the halls and all the fields, and she is referred to as Thjordmara, the great maiden, surrounded by her group of nine ladies. Most scholars agree that this is Freya. And as Svipdag looks into the beautiful hall, he suddenly remembers that he has been married to the maiden all the time, but that he had forgotten his true union with the maiden because he had died so many times. And as he remembers his true identity and his true self and his true union with the great maiden, the impenetrable gates open wide and the lady of the halls and the fields wakes up and greets him as her true husband. As I've said time and time again in these videos, all the details and the very structure of these stories are deeply pagan in origin and reflect typical aspects of pagan rituals. They all follow the same structure. The hero seeks a vision through some pagan ritual that serves as a technique of ecstasy. He has a vision, and that vision usually includes the bright golden maiden hidden in the underworld, a vision that leads to the hero moving into that world and facing dangerous trials before he finally enters the halls of the Great Maiden and receives her drink and her embrace. The goal, when it is stated, is usually to reach Valhalla, the alternative afterlife. The maiden that is sought by the hero is always described in the same way and has exactly the same function and lives in the same kind of place, the underworld. But she is, she is the brightness within the deepest depths of darkness. She is sometimes a giantess and sometimes a goddess and sometimes a Valkyria. Some of the Valkyria poems makes it clear that the Valkyria reincarnates or that she falls asleep and returns with a new name every time she wakes up and she can only be waken up by someone who has no fear. As I've said before, the maiden with the mead is an aspect of the great goddess and to every human being she is fate. The goal of the initiation is to wake up and unite oneself with one's personal fate goddess, an aspect of the great goddess yet an individual fate. What I want to stress here is that all these stories follow the same structure, the same pattern of initiation, and all show that they have the same goal. And the poetic Edda is crammed with these stories. They actually completely dominate the whole collection of pagan poems, which is the reason why I believe that the poetic Edda is, in fact, a testimony to an actual pre-Christian pagan lore, remembered by certain people who managed to maintain the poems quite unaltered until they were written down during the 12th century. And I suspect that the deeply pagan character of this collection of ancient poems, and especially the fact that they all deal with a kind of salvation, is the real reason why the manuscript was hidden away from the 13th century and did not resurface until the 17th century AD. This is 400 years, 400 years this manuscript was hidden away. And there's a reason for this. So, 